Hi everyone and welcome to another Sunday talk within the Nine Side Circle. I'm one of your two hosts back from my adventures, Nor Kyle, along with the other one of your two hosts, Mushtaq Ali. And we want to thank you for joining us once again, whether you're joining us live as we have many lovely folks joining us tonight or watching on YouTube after the fact. We really want to welcome you too. And whether it's your first time or you've been here a bunch of times, we are so happy to have you. So welcome. And so that leaves us with our YouTube spiel. Is that my cue? Yeah, yeah. All right, so uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, welcome. We are really happy to have you here. And if this is your first time watching us, let me invite you, or even if it's not your first time and you haven't done it yet for some reason, uh, let me invite you and encourage you in the most sincere way possible to hit that subscribe button. Um, we would love to have you subscribe to our channel um, and also hit the like button because if you like us we get higher up in youtube's algorithm and uh, more people can find us and the word gets out and we will be able to reach our goal of getting over a thousand subscribers not because we really need a thousand subscribers but that's the only way to take control of people putting commercials in front of our videos. Uh, that is our plan to hit that thousand and then manually demonetize uh, as many videos as we can so that you are not subjected to obnoxious uh, commercials when you try and watch our channel. Yep, and we are really looking forward to reaching that goal you know, however long it takes. And yeah, they have some really stupid commercials. <laughs> yeah, some ones they really do not reflect, you know, what we stand for. And that can be frustrating. But with your help, we'll be able to put those aside and, you know, just focus on the process of waking up and becoming a mature adult. Those are the things we really care about. Yes. Speaking of which, is there not an event coming up that uh, might move one in that direction? Sure. Um, so for the month of October, just like last year, we are going to be doing our annual virtual retreat. So this is the nine-sided circle annual virtual retreat. And we are giving everyone notice that it is going to be similar to last year. We're going to be doing it through October, but ending just before Halloween. So that if that's something that you enjoy celebrating, we do not want to take that away from you, just like we enjoy it. And we want to participate as well. So we will be doing some collecting of recipes this year. And we would love for anyone interested in contributing a recipe that suits the, uh, yeah, the, um, the eating protocol that we recommend during that month. So we'll be putting that out there as well so that you guys can get an idea of the kinds of things that would be good to have on hand for then. And if we can share recipes together, then we can kind of inspire each other to make this an enjoyable thing to do. And of course, we'll have a reading and we will be doing some... What else are we doing, Ms. Chalk? Well, there will be the readings. There will be the daily practices for the retreat. Mm -hmm. um, there will be weekly Zoom meetings for everybody who can make it. Yeah, just like Talk last year. Yep. Yeah, just like last year. It's a check-in, you yeah. know? It's not going to be a big thing. So. Yeah, and those meetings will not be public. The, the, only the people who are in the retreat will get a link to, mm -hmm. to them. Not recorded, not public. Yeah, they'll be recorded, up. but they won't, uh, they won't Okay, yeah, for the people, yeah, in the retreat, yeah, yep. So, we will have more details forthcoming. I think I'm going to be sending out a newsletter within the next week and a half, so there will be more information there. And, of course, we'll be talking about it every Sunday as well. So, you will 
also be able to reach us on Facebook or via our email or via the comments on YouTube or on our Facebook page if you want to get in touch with us with certain specific questions and we'll be happy to answer them to the best of our ability prior to. Yep. Anything else, Mishnah? Um, buy our t-shirts. That's right. Yep. Yes. Everybody needs some, some nine-sided circle swag. You can find mm -hmm. it in the description below. Um, and they're pretty groovy. I should be wearing mine, but I'm not. Yeah. I got to wear mine on vacation, though, so that was fun. <sighs> oh, that's all of the commercial stuff out of the way. There. All right. So we hope you will join us, and we hope that you'll find it a positive experience. We will be doing it as well ourselves. So it'll just be something we can do alongside one another. I think it'll be good. Yeah, and there will be physical practices and um, meditative practices. Mm -hmm. Probably a recitation because that went really well last time. Mm -hmm. And everything is optional, but everything we suggest, we suggest because we think it may be a benefit. So. No yeah, and nothing is required. You can be a yeah. member of the retreat and hardly do anything other than have moral support. Enjoy the ambiance, whatever. <laughs> but All we right. had a really good experience last year, so mm -hmm. we hope people will yeah. join in. And it won't we... take you away from your life much. Nope. You might have to give up some TV. Or sugar. And or. or sugar, yes. Yeah. Ooh, cat. <laughs> Hello, Cherise Kitty. All right. Um, so what are we talking about this evening, Mishnah? We're talking about... We're talking the about... The trap of omniscience. The trap the of omniscience, of yes. Teachers, specifically? Teachers and students. It's a trap mm. in both directions. Yeah. And it's one that will have a tendency to get you in a lot of trouble. Um, see, the problem is, so here you are, and you are working on waking up. And you wake up. Just because you have woken up, it doesn't mean that you are any smarter than you were the day before. You don't acquire magical skills. You are not all of a sudden more knowledgeable about human health than uh, a doctor. And yet, people make this assumption, students make this assumption. Um, there, there's a, a guy who many years ago went to India and he studied with uh, one of the big gurus. I think it was, uh, I think it was Muktananda. And so he learned all of the, the guru stuff, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, obedience and everything. And then he went and, and met with this Advaitist teacher. And the Advaitist teacher, after sitting with him for a while, said, you could benefit from spending a little time here uh, if you're willing to do so. Are you willing? And of course, him being a good student and having learned all of the stuff that he was supposed to learn said, whatever the guru thinks is best is what I'll do. And the teacher said, no. We don't play that game here. That game is for people who want to make money. We're not about money. You come because you choose to come, not because I'm the guru and I say that you would benefit. And that was like startling to him. Uh, but in the end, it turned out to uh, have been a really good thing for, for him. Uh, he turned out okay. On the other hand, uh, 
So there's the, there was a Sufi teacher. He's passed on now, but he was a big Sufi teacher. And when I say big, I mean his turban was like this. His beard was down to his belly button. Uh, he only dressed in 19th century uh, or medieval clothing. Uh, so was he a muse museum Sufi? I would say so. Mm. But his students would follow him around and whatever he said was like the word from on high. And usually I don't care about that kind of stuff. But one day he said, you women here, if you are pregnant, under no circumstances will, should you allow yourself to be uh, ultrasound tested because it will damage your baby's DNA. And they all uncritically were just sitting there nodding their head. Now, he was not a doctor of any sort, either traditional or modern medical or anything like that. He had no background and he had nothing to back up this, assert this assertion. And nobody questioned, why would you say this? How do you know this is true? What evidence do you have for this? They just went, oh, of course. And, you know, I know over the years, consequently, a few women had preventable problems with their pregnancies because they never had themselves looked at. So they never got ultrasounds. They never got saying. ultrasounds, yes. Because he had said that getting an ultrasound was somehow dangerous to their fetus's DNA. Yeah. Hmm. <sighs> so here's mm -hmm. the thing. Whatever you have now, when you wake up, that's what you're going to have then. You can test this out right now. Just, you know, take a moment and do a few breaths and ask yourself, am I awake or am I asleep right now? When you do that, you will at least momentarily enter into the awake state. Now, are you any smarter? Can you um, rebuild the transmission of a car if you couldn't before? I mean, you know, maybe you're an auto mechanic and you know how to do that. But if you're not, can you do that now? No. Being awake just allows you to wake up. You'll probably seem a bit smarter because you'll be more observant of the real world. You'll be more less present. lost in yeah. your own um, conditioning. But you're not going to be a genius unless you started out as a genius. You are not going to be able to give medical advice, advice with any sort of competence unless you've been trained to it. And one test I always use, you know, people say, oh, my teacher is infallible. And I ask them, if you needed an emergency appendectomy, would you let your teacher do it? And usually I get a look of utter horror from the people because the answer is no. I mean, I couldn't do an emergency appendectomy and I actually know how it's done. And I'm not competent to do it. I've seen it done but I don't have the fine motor skills that a surgeon develops in order to pull that off. And in my experience, most awake people don't have that. I mean, maybe at, at the, the level of, uh, it's Krishna's birthday. So at that level of being, you could maybe pull that off. But we are not an incarnation of God in that sense. So, uh, it's best to bear that in mind. And 
it creates incredible problems for both the teacher and the student. Because first of all, the teacher will never know what's really going on with the students. Works like this. Noor, pretend that you are a good student. Not me, but okay. Okay. And I will pretend to be the teacher and I say, Noor, um, you will not be happy unless you go out right now and get a job as a waitress and do selfless service that way. Mm. And if she's a good student, she's going to say, Yes, my lord. Yeah. Or yes, teacher. Yes, sheikh. And you know what happens? She goes out and she tries to get a job as a waitress and maybe she finally gets one and she hates it and she hates every minute of it and she gets resentful and finally she blows off the entire teaching. Mr. That's Mark bad there. enough. Mm -hmm. But if I say to her, Noor, you have this dread disease yes. and the only cure for it really is not in modern medicine. It is in drinking vinegar three times a day. Mm. Pure vinegar. If you do that for a month, you will not have this disease anymore. That's a lot of vinegar. That's a lot of vinegar. And since the vinegar has nothing to do with the disease, what will happen is she won't have the disease in a month because she'll be dead. <laughs> Can vinegar do that? Or you mean because of the disease? Yeah. Because of the disease. Yeah. If you like, don't treat the disease properly, yeah. it doesn't yeah. get better. And this is not to say that allopathic medicine is the only route for treating the disease. You know, you can go to a really competent, well-trained Ayurvedic doctor or doctor of Chinese medicine and get some pretty damn good treatments. Mm-hmm. Um, but they are people who have studied this. Yeah, that's a speciality. Yeah, and they've p oftentimes put uh, years of training into their craft. Yep. So this is a heretical point of view. But here's the thing, and this goes to what we were just talking about. I've said this before, and I'll undoubtedly say it again. Real communication happens only between equals. If we are in a hierarchical situation where, say, I am the teacher and you are the lowly student, uh, you have to tell me what I want to hear, not what's true. Because there is... Uh, negative consequences to telling me anything that I don't want to hear. Yeah, in an environment like that, there's a lot of policing that develops. Yeah. To save face and to sometimes protect the teacher's ego from, yes. you know, where they fall short in their omnipotence. Or to protect the school. Mm-hmm, yes. Yeah, we see this in cults all the time. Um, there is a uh, one particular cult who shall remain nameless, where the leader of the cult wrote all of this stuff. And he told his students, this is how it works. And if you follow these steps, step by step, exactly as I wrote them, then you will get these effects on everyone. And so they do that. To this very day, the, the leader of the cult has been dead for several decades now. But the people are still, every day, they get out there and they run down these lists of things that they have to do. And they don't get the effects that were promised. This is, this is self-evident and obvious from the outside. They are not getting the effects that the leader claimed. But they still do it. And they police each other around doing yes. it. Yes. They lie to each other that they are enjoying the declared benefits and then meanwhile all of them are wondering 
I'm not feeling it yet, but everyone says they do, so maybe it'll show up eventually. And then it never does. And then they feel like they're the unique failure. Yeah. And it, there's this a, a weird test that you can do. Uh, you get three people together and you work out a deal of uh, they're going to come up with the wrong answer on a question. And you get one person who's not in on the joke. And it'll be like, pick which one of these numbers is going to be most close to the answer. Mm -hmm. And what will happen is if the three people in on the joke pick the wrong number, the person not in on the joke will also pick the wrong number even though he thinks that it's wrong because he doesn't want to be part of uh, a the out group. Yeah, the outcast, yeah. Yeah. So what happens with this is that the teacher gets more and more in a bubble. The students get more and more delusional and they spend their time pleasing the teacher and telling him what he wants to hear. And I say him because it's almost an, always a, a, a man. In this, in this framework. In this yeah. framework. Mm -hmm. yep. It's like between Noor and I, I would be the person most likely to do this. We've been keeping him on track thus far. Yeah, she's, she's good for that. She keeps my ego pretty much in check. <laughs> so, in the work, we make sure to keep this horizontal, where there is no hierarchy of the enlightened one at the top and all of the uh, humble devotees below that. It's, you know, it's all Indians, no chief, as opposed to all chiefs, no Indians. And as we've said in other contexts, everybody has what they know best. And in that context, they are the one who is in a position of benefiting others with their wisdom. So it makes sense to listen to them and to give them a platform on which to share their knowledge and their experience. And each of us has something to share in that way. And the thing is, the best of intentions can get lost when this is the case. And what happens is that teachers will tell you things that are not within their purview as a teacher of awakening. Mm -hmm. So that's Noor's and my job. We're here to help people wake up. And we're fair to middling at that. Not too bad. But if we start telling you other stuff, it's like it's your duty to question and it's our duty to listen to the questions and answer them as best as possible and if we find out that we have accidentally become full of shit to alter <laughs> our behavior and it's our responsibility to say in whatever way is appropriate that we don't know when we don't know Yes, and that is perhaps the key to this. It's all right not to know. There's a great story about Mullah Nasruddin. Some students came to him one day and said, Mullah, what happens after we die? And the Mullah said, I don't know. And the student said, but, but, but you're a saint. And Mullah said, yes, but I'm not a dead saint. And that's important to remember. So we have a comment from Mr. Keane. Yes. Would you say it's a red flag to find such a teacher slash group? For example, a teacher or group who believe in some conspiracy theory? 
Um, yes. A conspiracy theory, by definition, has no actionable evidence. So, let's take uh, QAnon, because that's, that's been in the news. QAnon is this weird conspiracy theory uh, that is passed around the internet. And one of the things that uh, they decided was that there is this cabal of cannibalistic um, human trafficking pedophiles within the, the liberal media and the Democratic Party, led by Hillary Clinton. And they're based in this pizza parlor in New York City. And in the basement of the New York pizza City. parlor, in any case, yeah. Or maybe Washington, D.C., one of these mm -hmm. places. And uh, in the basement of this, they keep uh, children to sell and or eat. Lots of people believe this. Some people believed it so much that one guy showed up at this family pizza place with a gun, deciding that he was going to uh, liberate all of these children imprisoned in the basement. Wonder of wonders, the place had no basement. This was completely delusional, but people bought into it. That's a mass delusion. Mass delusion. We see that, I mean, even today, the, the conspiracy theorists around COVID-19 the big thing for them now is to take horse dewormer because they think it will prevent or cure the virus. First of all, horse dewormer is a vermifuge. It's not an, uh, it's not an antiviral. Second of all, the doses that it is, um, it means that you can buy it in are for a 1200 pound animal. which is why there have been several overdoses. Mm -hmm. uh, there is zero evidence that there is any efficacy to this. And yet people believe it. People believe it over things that there is plenty of evidence that it works. It's almost as though, you know, the ubiquity of the evidence is what makes them question it at this point because they're like, oh, this must be propaganda, yeah. and therefore I reject it. Yeah, or the source of, of the evidence, because here right. in the States, everything is, is broken down into liber liberals and conservatives, though the names mm -hmm. don't mean anything anymore. Right. It's, there's my group and the group that I hate, and anything that might seem that it comes from the group that I hate must be wrong, regardless of the evidence. <sighs> Sorry. And everything that comes from the leaders of my group must be right, even if there is no evidence for it. This is the kind of delusion that human beings are really prey to. And while it's bad in the realm of politics, it is so much worse in the realm of spiritual practice. Joe, you have your hand up. Did you want to say something? Oh, I have you. I, if you want to unmute, I just. Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry there about that. There you go. Yeah, no worries. Yes. All right. Um, I find that conspiracy theories in general are very toxic, mm -hmm. and. Um, Personally, I went down a lot of those rabbit holes. Um, I know we might have some people who don't live in, in the United States. I don't live in Missouri, but Missouri is called the show me state. Mm -hmm. So now, if someone says, says, well, they say this, like for example, 9-11 was inside stop, inside job. I'll mm -hmm. be like, okay, where's your evidence? That, no matter what it is, even someone who I listen to along, I try to agree with, they say something that 
it's not fishy. I don't just look my into it. I look into it. And if it's bullshit, I go on the site and say, no, you're full of, excuse my language here. You're, you're full of crap. Oh, you can say shit here. We're all adults. <laughs> okay. Here. All right. I'm sorry. You know? <laughs> so that's my general position. I was, you know, because facts do matter. They do. Yeah. Yeah. They do. Yes. Unless they, unless they disagree with what you already believe. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I, I used to have arguments with that. It's like, jet fuel can't melt steel, right? And I look at them, I'm a blacksmith, right? I, I, I actually work steel, and I have made my own steel, starting from iron ore, using a process called a bloom furnace. And I use charcoal to melt steel. A bloom furnace is basically just a, a big tube that won't burn up. Mm -hmm. You put fuel in the bottom and it sucks air through and it will melt the iron out of the iron ore and it will form what's called a bloom at the bottom of the furnace. Now I look at a building like the World Trade Center and I go, that is a giant bloom furnace. So it doesn't matter if the initial fuel won't melt steel because the air rushing up through the building will heat the fire hot enough to melt pretty much anything you got. But they don't want to hear that. So I eventually learned to just smile and walk away. <laughs> it's tough. Got to kind of develop self-discipline to walk away like that yeah. yeah and you have to maintain a really solid awake state so that you mm. don't fall into your own conditioning and be made crazy by the whole thing yes yeah so i have a question yes so i have encountered some people who may not argue for like broad open-ended omniscience on the part of their teachers or you know whoever they may have put on a spiritual pedestal how about selective omniscience such as do you have any thoughts on that well i mean like oh you know they know all but only in this specific subject matter ah like the pope who was infallible in matters of religion when he's speaking as the pope along yes like that's a good example yeah yeah mm -hmm. so how do we know that the pope is infallible in matters of religion because the college of cardinals says so how do we know that the college of cardinals are, is infallible in matters of the pope because the Pope says so. <laughs> That's almost always how it works, isn't it? Yeah, it's almost always how it works. This is not to say that, I mean, the teachers that I have had, some of them have had uncanny insight into the egos of their students and knew exactly when to apply what technique, how much pressure for how long, in what direction to help them grow. Um, in my experience though, in all cases, that came from a long apprenticeship with their teachers learning how to do this. It didn't magically appear the moment they awakened. Mm. So that was learning and hard work, just like anything else. Yeah. And perhaps some, some like honed intuition as well. Again, yeah. that takes a certain amount of self-discipline and intentionality. And hard work. And yeah, hard yeah, work. Yeah, the thing is, when you can enter into the awake state, when you can be in the natural state of deconditioned consciousness, you pay attention so much more deeply that it is a bit easier to learn these things and you will see things that other people miss. Which I've said before is 
what magic mostly is, is paying attention. Mm -hmm. You pay attention to what people don't pay attention to, and it looks like magic. So, have I upset enough people yet? Are any feathers ruffled? I don't see anybody going to get the, uh, <laughs> the stake in the piles of wood, so that's a good <laughs> sign. So, yeah, any questions are welcome, whether you want to type them in or unmute. Any thoughts from Mr. King? Um, we have one. It looks like this is, yeah, this is another question. Yeah. From, for some teacher who seems to be genuine or excellent in some area, but believes in some conspiracy theory, should we leave them or just selectively learn from what they are excellent at? Um, I am a great believer in, if you can, selectively learning from what they're excellent at. So if you have like a, a Zen teacher who is really good at Zen, really, really good at Zen, uh, and they believe that the earth is flat, you can still learn Zen from them if they don't insist that you also believe that the earth is flat. So again, that seems to require a sense of maturity within yourself so that yes. you don't get stuck in this sense of cognitive dissonance and you're stressing out like oh my god if they're wrong about this what else are they wrong about like you you kind of have to be able to stay grounded within yourself in order to hold those seeming contradictions right would you say yeah. don't get lost but also don't throw away wisdom when you see it that's yeah. that's what i would say it's like me, I am pretty sure that there are spirits that live in the mountains near where I grew up. That are ancient spirits that have been there since the beginning of time and that they can interact with people. Now, I can offer no ev evidence to that whatsoever. I'm pretty sure it's the case, but I'm not going to ask anybody to believe that shit. So if you happen to be out in those mountains, you might experience some things that would make you wonder. Things that make you go, hmm. <laughs> yep. I have a question. Yes, yeah. please. Okay, so if I have a relationship with you, Mushtaq, where I really revere you and respect everything you say, and I make a promise to you that Anytime you want to come to visit us in Australia, you can stay at my house. You can live here. I'll help you. I'll put you up. Blah, blah, blah. Time goes on. My situation changes. I lose my dwelling. I have a new partner. And he doesn't like me. <coughs> and the promise that I made to you cannot be fulfilled without causing me deep distress in my own relationships. I don't fulfill my promise. Is that a bad thing to change the situation if things change? No. And it holds me to that promise. No. Um, if that happened between you and I, first of all, we would have a deal. Uh, if something changes, you got to tell me, though. That would be mm -hmm. part of the deal. You say, you can come to Australia, you can live in my house, you can do all of this kind of stuff. And I would say, thank you so much. I will take you up on that with the understanding that if something changes, you have to tell me. Mm -hmm. Then when something changes, you say, yeah, I lost my house. I have no place to put you up. I could either beat you up for that, which would accomplish nothing other than maybe hurt your feelings, and I still wouldn't have a place to stay because you don't have one. Or I could go, oh, I release you from your promise. Mm. That's how you handle it. That's what adults do. Mm. Anything else is kind of unreasonable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And 
you know, I know that there are, I, I have seen teachers that tried to, you know, force that uh, on people. And I don't like that. I don't like that at all. So does that make sense to you? Yeah, it's, it's just that from time to time, I have witnessed those sort of things where sometimes it's a, a promise of financial support or something. And, and at a time when it was possible to fulfill, it would have been fulfilled. But when circumstances change, uh, being able to say, uh, my heart was there, but mm -hmm. I can't do that anymore. But to be held to to that promise as if it was um, unbreakable. The so promises and statements and declarations, you know, they change, you know, people divorce and change and yeah. you mature in different directions. It doesn't work. So it's very hard Yeah. when that teacher um, makes you suffer. Yeah. Because you have to change your mind. Yeah, I'm. So, you and I, you you support us financially. Mm -hmm. You contribute to the work on a really regular basis. And what have I told you? However, I mean, there's there's been a few times when money has come up short for you, and and you said that. And what I've said to you, I don't care. You don't have to send me money. We like you. You support us. It's great when you do. Um, but adults understand that agreements can be renegotiated. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what being an adult is. Children yeah. don't get to renegotiate certain agreements. Adults can renegotiate agreements. And I think that's the key, because if you're renegotiating you know your commitments then that's an active engagement nobody's really bailing on anyone does that make sense mm. yeah and that shows a consideration for where people are at and what's actually possible for them at a given time and as you say a promise made in a time of plenty with the intention of being kept is a good thing but as you say circumstances change and if the ability to fulfill that promise isn't there that's just how it is in communicating that clearly shows maturity and thoughtfulness and consideration and receiving that communication and really understanding and trusting that it's all coming from a place of earnestness and good intention and a kind of like, con what's the word? A connection of the heart, mm. a commitment of the heart can manifest in, and be fulfilled in many different ways. Yeah, I remember, uh... Do you know who Werner Erhard is? I've heard the name. Yeah, he, he was a big uh, Western guru back in the, the 70s. And one of the big things w with him was keeping agreements, making agreements and keeping them. Uh, and if you, if you agreed to do something, this, this was one of those places where uh, he didn't care if you bled to death as long as you kept that agreement. And that was like, uh, that was dogma for the group. Um, mm. And a lot of people got hurt through that. And I was lucky in that I, I hung out with those guys for a while learning what I could for them. But then I ran across another guy who said, you know, all agreements are renegotiable. Just because you made an agreement doesn't mean that you can't get together with that person and renegotiate that agreement at any time because that's what adult human beings do. 
You make this point, Mushtaq, in the let me tell you about wolves. Yeah. Um, talk. Yeah. It's very point. Yep. Yeah, when a wolf becomes an adult wolf, they understand that they don't have to keep agreements just because you think that they should. Mm -hmm. So, the standard teacher-student thing is uh, hierarchical in its apparent child model. Today in the work, the teaching is non-hierarchical and it's an adult-adult model. And I'm not saying that the, the old model isn't useful in some ways, but I am saying that you really need to have a good teacher to pull that off and make it work. And if that teacher has even a little bit of ego left, they have some samskara that are lurking deep within their unconscious. Uh, that sort of relationship will hook into that and it will create terrible results. And I have seen this happen firsthand more than once in my life to people who uh, were really good when they started out and turned into worthless pieces of shit in, in the end. Yep, that's sad. Yeah, I mean, I... And some of them were friends of mine, so it, does, it makes me very sad when I think about it. Yeah. I've seen people give up parts of themselves as a result of being involved in a parent-child-like teacher-student relationship in which they felt they needed to give up their love of their love of acrobatics, for example, because it was seen as inappropriate for a woman. And they felt that that was a good my friend felt that that was just a lesson that they needed to learn and even though they were chafing against it perhaps there was something to be gained out of having that drop away from their lives and i honestly don't think that that was beneficial for her but she felt that she needed to defer to her teacher in that way and I do personally think this was an example of a teacher taking on more of the mantle of wisdom than perhaps they had really earned. So, it's unfortunate. Now understand when I'm talking about this, I am not suggesting that any given teacher doesn't know some really important stuff. If your teacher is good, then they are better than you at this whole learning how to wake up thing. If they aren't, you have no business hanging out with them. But there's a difference between that and omniscience. So you, I mean, you can come to me and I can teach you the practices for waking up and I can guide you through them and I can help you, uh, you know, work through some of the, the pitfalls and stumbling places and that's all good. But if I start telling you what lottery numbers to bet on, uh, you should probably run because that's not within my purview. I mean, if we could tell you what the big money was, I mean, how to get that big money, we would probably have it for ourselves. So, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> so, I'm noticing that Jonathan is unmuted. Yes. Um, Did you have, say a thanks, Jonathan. have a question? You've often said that the value 
of teachers for you has been that they call you out on your bullshit. So what about the responsibility as a teacher to call us out on our bullshit? Is that still something that you're prepared to do? Uh, absolutely, because that is within my purview. Mm -hmm. That's, That's what, what I, I do. Yep. And I'm good at it. I'm probably not as good at it as my teacher was, but I'm pretty damn good at it. Um, that's what people come to me for, is to help see, see through that. What they don't come to me for is medical advice. You know, and I can give a little bit of medical advice because I have a background in medicine but most of my med medical advice is, you know, you should see a doctor about that. You know, there are some things like I have a couple of students who are pregnant. And I have said to one of them, uh, because she's getting a little morning sickness, you know, a, a traditional cure for that or a treatment for that is candied ginger. Candied ginger will settle your stomach. Uh, you might want to try that and see if it works. But that's not saying this is going to work and you should not listen to the advice of your doctor. But I will tell her if she is bullshitting herself about something. I will point it out and she's still welcome to disagree with me. Does that make sense, Jonathan? Are you seeing the, the nuance there? Yes, yes, thank you. Cool. Yeah, it's like with any guide, a guide can only take you to where they themselves have been. So I can take you to the place of waking up, but I can't take you to the place of me removing your appendix. You know, I can't do, give you advice on, um, you know, what to do about a bleeding ulcer other than go to the ER now. I can tell you a few things about diabetes and a few things about kidneys because I know a bunch about those, but it will always end with, and you should talk this over with your doctor. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of nods and stuff. Yeah. Yep. Does anyone else have any thoughts or questions? Or answers. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, one question is, does waking up make people feel like they're omniscient? Is that why this is so tempting? Um, that's a good question. That is a good question. See, you can, you can reach a state of awakeness and still have a lot of conditioning intact. And I have a feeling that that's where uh, you get trapped. I think it can feel so overwhelmingly expansive that some people get this sense of like, oh my God, everything is revealed to me now. And that can get you into trouble if you, you know, don't kind of reground after that and realize, you know, that was a very lovely feeling and I treasure it. But I also know that I'm still the same person. Does that make sense, Nancy? Yeah. Yeah. And you can have, with a lot of work, abiding non-dual awareness. 
in which case you're pretty much awake all the time. But you can have non-dual awareness. And the moment that you get that, uh, this, this re reflects back to uh, my talk on dating the goddess Maya. <laughs> if you wake up and you have not completely cleaned out your ego, uh, Maya is going to start whispering into your ear. She's going to be telling you things. Uh, and she's going to distract you. And you can, you can wander off with that. And the initial awakening is really powerful, and therefore uh, you can be susceptible to that kind of uh, internal whispering. Which is another reason to have a teacher who doesn't think that they're omniscient, or omniscient, however one is supposed to say that. Uh, because they will have remembered how that happened for them, and when you start waking up and going, Oh, oh, I'm God. And you can go, no, God is you. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. And then it'll take a while to figure out what that difference is. I guess they got disconnected. Yeah, it's too bad. They always have something good to say. So. Well, um, he, you know. Yeah, we get them back in. Yeah. Do you have a tip on how to respectfully challenge a teacher that you love and trust and to be able to challenge something that you think this, this in my heart of heart, this is not the truth or this is a misunderstanding of something or whatever, you know? So how, how do you keep your agency in that way? Because it is easy when you love and trust somebody, you can fall asleep and think, I'll just accept everything they say. And then all of a sudden they start saying things. You started talking to me about a teacher having feet of clay. Yeah. That's one of the things that you have to remember is that all teachers have feet of clay. Or you might as well assume so. I mean, maybe mm -hmm. there's a teacher out there who has completely cleaned out their ego to the point where there is nothing left. Um, I couldn't tell you who that is. Uh, the only thing I can tell you is that it's not me yet. <laughs> Pretty sure it's not Noor. It's not, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we have our, we keep finding stuff. We keep cleaning out the house. Um, and that's important for the teacher to realize. I mean, yes, I can sit and move into a state of awakeness, of non-dual awareness, and be there. But if I do that, it's hard to figure out what I want to cook for dinner. <laughs> so I have to kind of slip out of that a little bit. And the moment I do that, I can find bits and pieces of the ego that are still needing to be dealt with. One of the... Yeah, mm -hmm. one of the great realizations of the Yoga Sutras, um, and I'm going to paraphrase a lot on this because I don't have it in front of me, uh, says, you do all of this stuff, and the, the surface stuff is cool. It becomes placid. But underneath, you have samskara, which translates... Uh, one translation I like is subliminal memory traces. Stuff that you have from this life, maybe other lives, who knows, that is deep in the unconscious and will affect you until such time as you deal with it. And, and Noor has seen me get stuck with this uh, a mm -hmm. few times where I'm moving along and all of a sudden I'll get grumpy about something and I'm not even sure why. And then an hour later I go, oh, this is that from when I was like 10 years old and I've been carrying this shit ever since then and it's just now bubbled up to the surface. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then we, we talk about it or just the acknowledgement. Yeah, and do go. the practices to clean it out. Mm -hmm. But to get back to your question, now if it's me, 
you can say to me, you have my permission to say to me, you know, that really seems full of shit. And that's not going to hurt my feelings, at least not too much. Um, and then we'll talk about it. But that's my agreement with you or with anybody that I work with is that uh, you get to give me feedback even if you think I won't like it. And if I can't take it, then you get to call me on that. With any other teacher, it's going to depend on who they are. Uh, I Can I like say something? To... Yes. Uh, somewhere I feel uh, a balance is needed because the people who are learning from you, they are going to call you in any way. Uh, supposing somebody has to go through an angioplasty, the doctor says that you go through an angioplasty, but he's going to phone me and ask me that if you say I'll go through it. Uh, and we have to somewhere balance this in our life because we are related to these people. I mean, to everyone, even though we are friends, we don't want to have any hierarchy, but still it automatically comes a little that they are asking you whether they should go through the angioplasty. Like I've been having children's camps for the last 30 years and the children have grew, they grow up and when they want to go into college, they come and ask me, which line should I take? Which profession should I take? So, I mean, somewhere we have to balance this, the one part of waking up and one part of where we relate to others uh, who are related to us in some way. Okay, and you're absolutely correct. Sorry, I don't have any information about that. <laughs> <laughs> My external uh -huh. ego there. <laughs> So, you are absolutely correct, and it's tricky, because if, if um, say, Charisse said to me, um, I need to get, according to my, to my doctor, I need to uh, have an angioplasty, what should I do? Um, I have to balance out, how much do I know about heart surgery? Mm. How much do I know about her well-being? And, and my answer will be something along the lines of what is, according to the doctor, what is the prognosis if you don't have it? And it might be, oh, I'll be dead in six months. Uh, and it might be, I don't know. And then my question would be, would you like to get a second opinion from another doctor? <laughs> and then it would probably be, you know, I would really like for you to stay alive. So I would be happy if you got the treatment. But I'm not going to tell her that I think that she should. There's, there's a rule with that. And Nora will tell you this. And all the times that she was my student, I told her that she had to... Uh, who this is. Uh, is it up, maybe? Maybe. It said Ohm. I have only given her an order maybe twice. It's true. Yeah. And the reason for that is something I learned from my teacher who said, if I give you an order and you don't obey it, there is a consequence for that. So I avoid giving orders as much as possible and will only do so when it's absolutely necessary. And I think that's good general advice. Yeah. And then for me in particular, there is a sense in which part of the teaching for me was to have the confidence to make my own decisions. And so if you were to give me the answer you know to give me the direction to go in and i just kind of accepted that as is without thinking for myself about what a good solution or course of action for me might be then i'm still going through the same asleep programming 
that I've gone to and depended on all along. Yeah, and the worst part, according to my teacher, is that if you take over responsibility for telling your student what to do, and they do something stupid, that's on you. If you tell them, do this, don't do that, and they do it, you get the responsibility for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would rather usually put on that these are the options and you try to right. come to a right picture. Yeah, exactly. Try to help them exactly. come to a right picture. Yeah. And not, you know, give an order. Definitely not. Uh, mm -hmm. so I've been practicing homeopathy for a number of years. So, I mean, medically, I can give a little bit of uh, advice. So yeah. And you notice the key, the key word there, a number of years, you're not magically pulling homeopathic remedies out of the, the air. You've actually learned some stuff and that makes a big difference. You've put the, the, the time in study, you've learned to give good advice. The other thing that I would bet you that you would... Can we change our direction? On this uh, you know, uh, topic of omniscient, uh, there's a beautiful story in the Upanishad. I'm sure you've heard of it, where the father who is a rishi, he sends his son to the Gurukul, that is the school, to his teacher, when he's a young boy of five years old. And when he becomes a, you know, of age, about 15, 16, he comes back to his father. And it's early in the morning and the sun is rising and the father sees the son coming after so many years of learning with his teacher. And he feels the sun, you know, everything has gone to his ego. So when the sun comes, he asks him, then what did you learn with your teacher? And the son says, I learned this, I learned mathematics, I learned astronomy, I know everything. There's nothing which I don't know. And the father says, have you learned that one thing, knowing which nothing else is needed to be learned? Well, if you know that one thing, then you don't have to learn anything else. And so the son looks up inside and he says, no, I have not learned that. He says, go back to your teacher. He's not taught you anything. So we have this story. <laughs> in yes. Now, I would bet you that in the, the case of the angioplasty, for instance, that there is one other thing that would happen. Uh, if I was in that position, this is what I would do. And I would not be surprised if you did something similar, which is to tell that student, um, if you go in for your angioplasty, I'll go to the hospital with you. I will mm -hmm. sit there the whole time praying for your quick recovery. I will nag God until he gives me what I want just to shut me up. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, we can do that. <laughs> 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 And oftentimes that's the best thing a teacher can do is to support their student through these rough times. Mm -hmm. uh, because then they know that there is uh, somebody there for them. Yeah. And sometimes that is such a good motivator in one's own work to know that they have support behind them. So there we have it. <sighs> it's an interesting situation and uh, it's a little bit different than the old view, but mm -hmm. we are not in the old times. And some of the old stuff is really important still. Some of it has to change with the time. And what we need in this world today is adults. And to have we adults. We talked about this. Yeah, we talked yeah, about we this. Yeah, we talk time about this till we're again. blue in the face. Yep. It's, it's a reoccurring theme. And adults treat each other differently than adults treat children. Yep. Yeah, Joe. Um, so basically what we're saying here is that you find a teacher who says, I know everything, 
you say, okay. I wish you find someone who says, okay, well, this is what I think I know. To the best of my knowledge, but maybe you should figure it out for yourself. Because I've actually had a friend who uh, self-taught himself, very smart person, but he was like, I figured everything out. I was 19, you can't tell me anything. So I was like, okay, <laughs> that's what you think, whatever. Yeah. And realize that there's a limit to your knowledge. When I run across somebody who claims to, to know everything, I usually ask them for the square root of pi. Such a pain in the butt. But I am, yeah. I, I am yeah. a bad person sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Well, this person I'm not talking to anymore. He was a good friend of my life. Um, basically, we got into the debate about originalism. And um, I called him out on it because this is not a very nice thing I did. So, but he has a son who's transgender. Mm -hmm. And there was a case by the Supreme Court where Gorsuch sided with the liberals. I said, well, was Gorsuch um, using originalism when he when he decided to side liberals in this case? And he wouldn't touch that. So I tried that in the past when he was full of shit. Got pissed off too. Yeah. Getting pissed off when you encounter the truth is a telling yes. experience. <clears throat> and it's one of the things that my teacher said to me years ago. He said, you know, they left something out of the Bible when Jesus said, you will know the truth and it will set you free. Mm -hmm. He said, the original passage was, you will know the truth. And the truth will piss you off. <laughs> and then it'll set you free. <laughs> and Zainab showed up in here for a moment. Hello, Zainab. Where are we? There you are. How are you? We missed you. Yeah, I just had a disconnection. <clears throat> yeah, well, you're here now, and that's all that matters. Mm hmm. Yep. And we have Ohm. Uh, a mystery person. A mystery we may person. know, but are not sure that we know. Yes. But in any case, welcome. Welcome. Yeah, we're glad to have you here. Uh, hmm. So, that's pretty much what, what we got tonight. Yeah. So, if you have more questions or thoughts or answers, um, I would love to entertain them. How's it going, Levita? Yeah, I was just about to ask her the same thing. Oh, mind reading. Yep. I have nothing to add because I completely agree with you. Hmm. Well, thank you. Um, thank yeah. you very and much. That means that we're most likely right. So take note. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've found as I've gotten older that the more I learn about stuff, I realize there's so much I don't know anything about. Mm. I forget what that's called. Is that like yeah. the well, Dunning-Kruger effect or something like that? There's no, the Dunning-Kruger effect is where the dumber you are, the more you think you know. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, it's something about the more you know, the less you realize you understand <laughs> or know at large. It's it's humbling. Yeah. 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 It's like there's so much. This, like, for example, in the 21st century where we are now, if you have a smartphone, you don't even need a computer proper. You have a mm -hmm. smartphone. You pretty much have access to the accumulated knowledge and wisdom of the human race mm -hmm. and yet you know we've got people who are too dumb to come in out of the ring <laughs> you know and and honestly no one person can learn all of this stuff anyway right so if you're an expert at medicine you probably are an expert in medicine but your mechanic is taking you to the cleaners yeah oh yeah you know that's so true yep i knew a guy uh he was pakistani he was uh, a neurosurgeon and neurologist and absolutely brilliant at that. At every other part of his life, 
he was a complete and utter mess. You needed brain surgery, he was the guy. If you needed advice on what to do with your girlfriend, he's the last person you'd want to talk to. Well, there you go. Yeah. Yep. Well, one small thing about ignorance, mm -hmm. which is that they've tried to replicate the Dunning-Kruger effect, and it doesn't seem like there's much of anything there. Mm -hmm. Don't trust the social psychologists. There's a lot of, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of research done in that field that often proves hard to replicate, but I think we can draw inspiration from it in terms of anecdotal things that seem to happen and what we can learn from them. But I do agree. You're right. Yeah. There's a lot to be said about that. Yeah. 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 Hope, uh, just want to ask, can there be a level of awareness that uh, goes today? I'm uh, in this moment, I'm awake. But then there are different levels. And uh, in India, uh, we heard that from many masters, they directly perceive things. They don't learn things, but they are at a heightened level of awareness that uh, they think they perceive things clearly. And uh, like Rishis, uh, Rishis have uh, seen the mantras and all the science of uh, science. They don't learn it, but they see uh, perceive that science. <coughs> uh, can you can you elaborate on that? Yeah. Um... With the Rishis, for instance, they spent how many years or centuries training themselves to this point? You know, it's not like it just magically happened. They worked very, very hard to be able to open up uh, their consciousness and get all of the crap of their egos out of the way so that they could have some direct experience. And I'm not saying that you can't have direct experience. Um, Usually, when that happens, it's in a, a, a few particular realms, like, for instance, uh, receiving the seed mantras or things like that, uh, where you are so tuned into the universe that you can read what's there. It's not how to fix a car. It's not how to play the stock market. It's not... Um, how to cure yourself of COVID through some untested, uh, wacky drug that nobody has ever heard of. So th there, there are rules to this, even at that level. And... In my own small way, I've had this sort of experience where I can directly understand how to do something. But when I look at it, I see all of the experience, all of, you know, 70 years worth of experience that came to that point where I can directly intuit how to do this one thing. So, yes, these guys were incredibly powerful and they spent very, very long lifetimes honing their tools. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. Great. Good question. Yeah, excellent question. Uh, Lavita has raised her hand, I think. Was that you meant to? Okay, great. Yeah. Go for it. Um, I think you're... Yeah, I'm unmuted. Yep. Um, the other thing I've noticed about really smart people who know a lot, the ones who don't let their ego take over, um, know where the edges of their knowledge begin and end. That's so, very important. Yeah. And it, it's like having raised a family, I've had to deal with many medical type issues. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've had people call me like I've taken kids to the doctor and the doctor was like, how did you know to bring them in? Cause I knew something was wrong, yeah. but I've had people say to me, oh, well, I've got this problem and I know you know a lot about, and I'm like, I'm like Mushtaq. Yes. You need to hang up talking to me and call 911. 
you know, I, I, I literally had somebody call me two weeks ago and said, this child got a cut and you know, what do I do? You know, what should I yeah. do? And I'm like, how long has the child been bleeding? Five minutes, hang up the phone <laughs> and call emergency services and go directly to the hospital because my expertise does not extend into stitching long distance over the internet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah, that, so, that's an important point. So, I mean, you know, like I've had people say to me stuff like that, and then you go, but again, if you live, you know, if you live for any length of time, once you get, I guess, over past the age of 40, if you're even halfway awake, you know, there's so much, so much, you know, nothing about, like, you can't even pull anything out of your butt. <laughs> you know, you got nothing. And that's where, that's where, but since there's so many of us on the planet, you know, there's somebody, there's somebody who's an expert in that esoteric thing that you know nothing about. <laughs> yup. Can you get access to them? Hmm. Sometimes, sometimes yes, but I can promise you if you have access to the internet, you can find some information <clears throat> yeah. somewhere yep. that will point you in the right direction to find that person. Yep. Yeah, and that's an important point. It's like when COVID hit, one of the things that you and I did was get a friend of ours who was an extremely good physician, very, very highly trained in emergency medicine and all sorts of things. This guy has more certificates than he knows what to do with uh, for doing medical stuff. Uh, and years and years of experience. And he, we actually got him on this channel on one of the Sunday talks to give some people the straight stuff. Here's what science knows right now. And here's the best way to not get sick and die. And his Things advice was way better than ours. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it meant a lot to us that he was he was enthusiastic about taking the time to share that you know share that insight with us yeah it makes his so. life easier less sick people to treat right yeah yep <sighs> all right who else have we not heard from that wants to say something or in david's case probably doesn't want to say something but we're going to call on him anyway <laughs> I was wondering about, we were talking a little bit about um, how adults resolve agreements and things between each other. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering how adults would renegotiate agreements with themselves. With themselves? You mean like towards oneself? Yeah. That can be tricky. <coughs> that can be tricky. Yeah. Because, I mean, I can think back to when I, when I was a young lad working on all of this at least three weeks ago. Um, <laughs> and I decided, for instance, I am not going to do X uh, in this length of time. And then my mind would start giving me all of the reasons why I sh it should be okay for me to do X just this once. Yeah. I deserve like, a treat or yeah. I deserve a break. It's my birthday. I should have a donut. <laughs> and you can talk yourself into it. And that's the danger uh, of this uh, when it comes to yourself is nobody can lie to you like you. Mm -hmm. You are your own best con man. So you have to be very, very careful when you are renegotiating your agreements. And for me, what always worked was seeking some outside advice. You know, so I would go to my teacher and say, I had decided to do this, but now I'm feeling like maybe I don't want to do this. Maybe I, I, I want this particular thing. Maybe I want the donut. Is this my ego or is this something that's real? And then I, I listened to what he had to say. Because a teacher's main job is to tell you when you're bullshitting yourself. Mm -hmm. So, no donut for you, huh? 
No donut for me. I guess that's one of the reasons why it's so important to find a good teacher that you can trust, that yes. won't just allow you. Um, I heard somebody say once, you can use logic to justify anything. Yes. That's its power and its flaw. Exactly. And then they were talking to someone else when they said this, and then they looked at the person and said, from now on, bring your logic to me. Mm. You know? Yeah. And then the person's response, which I thought was so... Uh, they were showing... They, they weren't trying to show it, but it showed to me how they were willing to be wrong and be taught. And the person looked at the person speaking and said, my logic was not in error, but I was. Mm. That's a good response because if you're really doing logic, it should give you the truth if you do it correctly. But you can trick yourself into doing it incorrectly and think you're doing it correctly. Especially if it's something you really want. Especially if it's that damn donut, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to throw any shade at you for the donut because, <laughs> well, <laughs> I love them too. <sighs> Me three. I had a Danish today. It was excellent. Oh, rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> it was a treat from a friend. I was not going to refuse. But, I mean, there could be a circumstance in which even that could be like, oh, well... I can't refuse this. It's a gift. And, you know. Yeah, and that could be bullshit because your friend mm -hmm. might understand if you said, I'm fasting right now and I would mm -hmm. love to eat this, but uh, I would have to break my fast. And is it okay with you if I don't? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. or even ask for a rain check. Like, yeah. can I eat? Can you, can you bring me a donut in two weeks' time? Yeah. <laughs> yep. I like that but example. Yeah. It's a fun one. Yeah. But yeah. I'm finding it interesting. It's like, it's not in the questions. It's in the questions too, but when you encounter a question, it's also in the response that you have. Like that, that first one that you don't, maybe don't act on, you know, like, yes, I want the donut. And then you take an extra second and go, do I really need to eat this donut? Does it really part? Is it really, is this really going to lead me to where I need to be? Or, you know, am I breaking an agreement with myself? Or am I just, you know, I'm just acting like a, a, a toddler. Sometimes a very clever toddler though. <laughs> oh, toddlers are very clever. Yes. Crafty yeah, I, I, even. I still do this sometimes. This month I have been on retreat, and as part of my treat, my retreat, I'm fasting every day, intermittent fasting, mm. 18 hours a day. And early on, when I had not overcome the initial uh, urge to eat, because you can't really call it hunger, because you don't get hungry in 18 hours. Uh, you just get an urge to eat. I, 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 I spent one evening going through, well, you know, I, I can take a one day's break from the fast. It would be all right. Uh, it won't hurt me if I have just this. And I had to wrestle myself down and go, cut out the bullshit. You're bullshitting yourself. Mm -hmm. You know you just want to eat that. You have no good reason for eating that. Stop it. Yeah. It can be hard. I think sometimes we're our own worst enemies. We're always our own worst enemies. Yeah. <sighs> well, any other thoughts or questions? How's it Queries going, Omar? I want to poke it. Yeah. Hey, what are you going to say? Did you have any? Oh, I'm just very grateful I have no donuts in my house right now. <laughs> yeah. That certainly helps, That's, doesn't it? That sounds like a joke, but it's not. 
Now that we've gotten everyone pining for donuts. <laughs> Time for a Sorry. run. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right. So, Ilmar, how's it going? What's perky? Oh, okay, I have nothing to disagree with and nothing to add. So. Yeah. All right. Lippin. That's fine. Just glad you're here. How about you, Chris? Nothing more to add. Okay, good. Seems Anything like to subtract. <laughs> Maybe. My, Maybe. My own comments. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, he is wow. clever. Quick on yes. his feet. Damn. <laughs> How about Ohm? I'm, I'm still curious about Ohm, and I just want to make room for them to chime in if they like. Okay. Uh, Rajan yeah. is saying. It was a great uh, session. Sorry. Well, it was a thank great you session. for coming Sorry, again. I have to we log out always now. love having you. Yes. Yeah. Please come yes, back thank you. soon. We will miss so you. So many of you. So many of you. It's great to have you. Okay. Take good care, everyone. All right. So I suppose we can wrap it up. Yeah. Are you done poking at home to see if they're going to say or type anything? Poke, 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 poke. All right. Well, we're happy to have you, even if you're just sitting there and listening and hopefully having a good time sitting there and listening. <laughs> hmm. All, All right. right, then. Um, let me switch over to Brady Bunch view. There we go. And we can all say goodbye. Bye. Bye. See you next time. <laughs>